All right, I'm going live. <clears throat> All right, so we're recording the session, everybody. What we're gonna do is work on starting to automate that form that we tried yesterday. So I solved the problem that we had with the fields being, some of them being doubled. It's an interesting problem, one that I can go into a little bit. So let me just show you what, what I figured out. And now this is working completely differently than it did yesterday. So solves the problem a different way. So what was happening was we were building a list of fields for us to use and select from to put onto our, our actual interview. And it was checking against a list like this to see which ones we didn't want to have personal questions for because we already wrote them. Things like what's the user's name, what's their date of birth, things that we know would be used on multiple forms. We just wanted to write one way and do it the best way that we could. In this section of the interview file, I build that list of fields that we captured from the PDF. And this logic here that I have commented out now, because it works a little bit differently, basically creates a new field object that we can assign different attributes to that are used to build that interview where we select which field goes where. And what I had done incorrectly was I only handled one of those cases in, in, in a certain scenario where the field already existed. And that meant that the old object was being reused. That I think if, if you were watching the stream yesterday, you might have seen me come to that realization. And that was the problem. It just took me a while to find out exactly where that was happening. It was this if statement right here that I have highlighted. I didn't have this else condition in there. So it would only skip it. It would only create this new field object on the right list if um, we were skipping it. And in this condition here that we were missing, it would still use the field object that was created the last time we went through the for loop. It's probably too much information for most of you, but just thought I'd report back on how I'd solve that bug. All right, so we're going to do all our work here in this playground that I have that I've called assembly line. And let me show you what I also spent some time doing yesterday. This was something Toby Kreidefi had start, started a draft of, which was really super, super helpful while working on different parts of the project. Um, this is basically our library of questions that are going to be used on all of the interviews. So we have some questions here about like, what's your name? Um, we have the ability for people to add multiple users to, to the form. Some of the forms expect that. They have like a place for two different tenants to sign, for example, that are both leaseholders. So we wanted to be able to accommodate lists of people, not just one person at a time. 
So that's what this question here is. One of the nice things about DocAssemble is you can write a question once and you don't have to write one for each person, for example. So this asks for the, the first person's name. That's going to be you. So we have that written in a special way. What is your name? We also have the ability to ask follow-up questions using the generic object feature of DocAssemble. The benefit of that is that, like this question for what's your address, it says, it asks for the, per it kind of reflects back the person's name that we're asking about the address of. And we only had to write this once. So if we translate this question, it's going to be translated for every person that we're collecting information about on the form. And that might be like a child, potentially. The child has their own address on some of the family law forms. Um, it could be about the address of the user, the first and second user of the form. It can be about the address of the other party. We've written one question that can be translated using all the best practices without us having to do anything else special. I'm going to just do one change here that I'm noticing. I want to use the address autocomplete feature of DocAssemble. What that does is it allows you to use the Google API to get back a list of addresses that are near you when you start typing an address. You've all seen this before on Google Maps. It's a feature that's integrated into DocAssemble. That was a um, hackathon project at the Innovations and Technology Conference, the Legal Services Corporation runs every year, just a few years ago. And actually happens to be the same year that my youngest son was born. I wasn't able to be there in person, but I worked on that project a little bit remotely. Literally the day before the hackathon was when my son was born. By the way, if you're watching this and, and you want to say anything, I think we have the chat feature in um, in Twitch. That's one way that you can talk to me. Another way is if you're on our Slack channel, you can do that. Oh, I'm just taking a look at the stream now, and I'm noticing the lighting is a little weird. Let's see if I can fix that. Not really. That's okay. It's not the point of this. All right, so we turned on address auto completion. Let's look a little bit at some of the other kinds of questions. Here we had, this is another generic question that works for any person. That's a class um, in object-oriented programming that we're, it's called individual, that's built into DocAssemble. And we're asking for that person's contact information. Again, we only have to write that once. I'm gonna change one thing here, which is we want phone number, not phone. Similar question here for the signature. Just one version of that question that we need to write. And um, that covers most of the, of the generic questions. Now, something I started to work on here is the signature flow we're gonna want later, where someone can ask for their signature. <clears throat> they can either use the device they're already using, which might be a desktop computer, but often, you want to send it to someone to sign, or you want to send it to yourself so you can sign it on your phone, which is a much easier interface than signing it on a computer with a mouse, right? Like wiggling around a mouse to try to sign your name is a little tricky. So that is what this all controls. And that's something that I wrote already for the um, Massachusetts Defense Against Eviction tool. So I, I've copied that in. I have a feeling we're going to need to tweak that a little bit more than I have done so far to enable us to... Um, to get that just right for this purpose. But this is going to be a good draft. You can see there's a lot of code here, a lot of boilerplate language that I'm not writing from scratch. Let's see. So it started on line 121. Then we have the logic goes all the way down to line 220. Oh, and actually there's a few more places here. This I'm going to take out. That was a mistaken copy. So we have like 150 lines of code here that I've already written once in Massachusetts Defense for Eviction that I could copy in here. The beauty of open source. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay. So let's leave that alone. I can see here there are a few fields that we never ended up defining. So I know right away if we use this, we're going to have to keep going back in, comparing it to the original, original code and, and figure out where those are defined. Oh, user isn't defined. So where do we have? Oh, we have user zero, but it really should be users zero. This little error 
a section on the right of your doc assemble playground is really useful for catching those kinds of bugs. So let's see where else we had user zero. I'm going to change that to users. This is kind of not the doc symbol programming you have to do for most kinds of interviews that you're writing. This is something you don't have to do for this project at all. This is kind of the back end piece that just adds a little bit of extra glitter to our project. Things like the signature um, workflow that we're talking about, where you send a form to, off to be text, text to somebody so they can sign it. That's something you don't need in, in a basic interview, but also we're doing it once for this project. You don't have to reinvent that part at all. I'm going to leave these alone. So this is the part where we're asking for the person's cell phone. We don't want to do that that way. Um, we're going to ask, we're going to show their phone. And we're going to default to the first user's phone number. And let's see. That'll get rid of that error. Started on phone. Is this something? that I think we must have defined inside Massachusetts Defense for Eviction, which is a pretty simple bit of code. Let's actually see if we can figure, find that now. I'm going to go to our GitHub repo. I know where I'm going to be looking in the code. I think it's going to be in the logic section. One of two different files, actually. So either this main eviction YAML or maybe the code specific YAML. This is just how I like to organize this interview. I, it's a, a long one, lots of code, so I put it in a couple different files. You don't need to do that. So let's find that variable we were looking for and make sure we get that in here. So it was started on phone, that's still red. So let's see if we can find it in one of these two files. All right, that is asking for it, it's not defining it. Okay, so maybe it's in this code file. Okay, there we go. So all it's really checking is, is this device a mobile phone? That's what this little code block does. I don't remember why I, I did it that way. I don't think I needed to. This is a great project because you can see, if you looked at it, you would see the evolution of my skills in DocAssemble and also the evolution of DocAssemble because it took a little over a year to finish. I, I knew a lot more by the end and DocAssemble had changed to add some really helpful features for us during that time. So I'm going to make a new code block here that has that little line so that variable is defined. This is a um, this device function here is something that's built into DocAssemble. You can always use it, and when you run it, it returns an object that has an isMobile property of it that tells you if the device it's using right now to run the interview is a mobile phone. Let me just explain why we're doing that check here. <clears throat> what I'm doing in this interview logic flow is checking to see if they're already on a phone. If they're already on a phone, we don't need them to text a link to their interview to somebody else to sign, generally speaking. Um, there might be cases where that, that happens, but generally speaking, if they're using it on, the, they're going to sign it themselves, for sure. They don't need to text it somewhere else to get it signed. They're already on a phone that has a, a touch screen. If they're on a desktop is when we want to show them that screen that lets them choose where they're signing. I don't know if we'll get to do that by the end of the stream, but I'll show you that at the right time if you want to see what that looks like. I know this is probably a little abstract right now. Um, okay, so let's jump back to where we were yesterday, which was working with our PDF and using our assembly line wizard. So I now have put a link to that in our Trello board. It's a good way for you to get to it. Right. And I, some people have already been using the tool, which is great. 
so they've done some thinking about which um, how the questions are going to be grouped and ordered. Hopefully we don't have any of the problems that we had yesterday. Yeah. There's always a chance when you're doing something live that something goes wrong. But I'm hoping that it doesn't. All right. So I've uploaded the housing TRO. Let's take a look to see. Okay. Um, like I said, I do see we have at least one viewer, so if you have any questions, feel free to send them in one of those different channels, either on the chat, which I think I can get access to, or on Slack, or whatever method works best for you. I know, so I said this yesterday if you watched the stream, but again, this is a draft. We know that we're going to get feedback from our experts along the way, and from our user testers along the way to improve these. But I like to get it pretty good in the first pass. So let's start by doing that. So I'm going to go jump now, and you won't be able to see this because of the way that the streaming is working, but I'm going to jump to the original form and copy some of the boilerplate language. You can look at this yourself later if you wanted to. It's gonna open in a new window, which you won't be able to see. And I'm just copying off the boilerplate text that it has there that says why you need this form. And I'm going to do a little bit of cleanup of that because it's a little different on the screen than it is on the... Okay. A couple notes about how this is all formatted. This is all markdown. Markdown is used lots of places, not just in DocAssemble. So if you Google, how do I do X in Markdown, you might find a good answer for you. There's some specific things to DocAssemble, but the basics are the same. So here, by putting a little star at the beginning of the line, it turns it into a bulleted list. If I want to have a new paragraph, I have to put an empty line in between each paragraph. These line breaks look kind of funny, right? But that's OK. Line breaks don't create a new paragraph in, in Markdown. You need to have two empty, you need to have an empty line in between for that to happen. So this is pretty good. This is referencing a packet, which we don't want to do. That doesn't make sense here. And we'll probably help somebody file the affidavit of indigency. I'm going to just write that in now. That's one of the forms that actually I've already automated, but we're going to adapt to this assembly line workflow that we have to make sure it works the same way as the other forms. Now, we don't know how service is going to work yet. The court hasn't answered that for us. We know that it's not going to be that you have to get, probably you're not going to have to have service by a deputy sheriff or constable. Um, there are going to probably be some better options that the court can recommend to you, and they, may, they might help you with that service. I don't know the answer to that yet, but long term, this advice still stands, so I'm going to leave it as is for now. Okay. <coughs> if you did stream us yesterday, then you, you'll see that we had some, um, we'd already gone over this part here. I know this is a housing form. Housing forms generally can be filed in each of these four courts. Boston Municipal Court is kind of like a special district court that covers the whole of Boston and they have their own separate divisions. It's the lowest level of court in the, um, and can only hear cases up to a certain dollar figure. Superior court is really rare to file something like this directly. It has to be over a much larger dollar figure than what can go in the district court. Housing court has jurisdiction over any housing case, and there's no minimum dollar amount. I always recommend someone file a housing form in the housing court. It might be harder to get to the housing court depending on where you live. The district courts, there are more of them, and they might be closer to you. But you might have a better experience in the housing court because it's a specialized court. Now, I just copied that link. Um, I opened it because I don't have that in the browser, but I'm going to copy it now. 
and put that here as a link to the original form. This is helpful for someone who's trying to debug this later. This interview file name, it's important that it's unique, uh, that it's descriptive. If when you upload your form, you don't get a good descriptive file name, then you should um, adjust it to write it to something that is descriptive. It does need to have, it does need to kind of follow the conventions of a variable name. So it shouldn't start with a number or an underscore. Ideally, it could start with an underscore, sorry. It shouldn't start with a number and it shouldn't have spaces in it. We'll handle some of those things automatically, but it's kind of nice if you can see what the ultimate file name will be as well. So it's best to just make it match like this one does here. So court county is one we're not gonna actually end up wanting to collect here. That's something I have to clean up later. And I don't know why it's in there twice either. But it doesn't seem like we have. Let's just look at this list to make sure there's no other problems. Nothing else seems to be doubled. Everything else seems to be pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and use this as my draft. It's not going to be a lot of cleanup work that I have to do. Let me make sure that, that I still I agree with that. I'm going to look at the form here. But either way, I'm going to start actually working on this form. So you're not having to, so you can see that part and get started on your own interview. All right. So yeah, um, I mean, this looks good to me. I think we captured the things we needed to capture. It's unique fields on that list. All right. If we miss something, I'll go back in and fill it out. We can do that after we've run the wizard. We don't have to do it right at this step right now. So let's see. You know what? <clears throat> Just to speed through this part, we spent a lot of time on that on the stream yesterday. I'm going to just do a couple of things. I'm going to make sure that the, the cost fields, I can just search for those, by the way. And actually, now I'm thinking that should be done in the wizard. Cost should be currency value. Oh, I think I know what happened. I, I just changed the, the wrong thing. When I was trying to search, I must have hit C and that changed. Okay, these I'm going to have to clean up later. These were doubled variable names. Because of the way PDFs work, you're only going to have the same field in there once. We don't have an automatic way to clean that up yet, but I'm going to be able to search and, and fix those later in the draft document. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to save those court county to the end because again, those don't need to be handled by this interview. So if we look at the TRO, I'm going to open that up and make that visible for you now, actually. All right. If we look at this form, the basic structure they have here is they have all the questions about where you live up front, and then we jump right into the reason why you need the temporary restraining order. Like, what did your landlord do to you? So this seems like a pretty good structure. On this date, the landlord did these things. Let's try to follow that same same structure. And let's see. We jump right to the possible things that they did. So trying to get the apartment without permission, not getting utility service, or interfering with the quiet enjoyment of the premises. I'm going to turn that capture off now. Okay. okay, so the first section is what happened. The sec second section is 
how much did it harm you? Like how much did it cost? Court County, we're gonna keep at the end because that's gonna just be, okay. So let's, let's phrase it like this. Why do you need the TRO? We already wrote that yesterday. So please, please um, select the reasons below that you need a temporary restraining order. That's going to be our first screen. Okay, so the second question we're going to have is, how did, oh, I, I phrased it differently yesterday. I'm going to keep the same thing. Tell us how this affected you. Please be specific about how the landlord's actions affected you. Might be a good short summary for that screen. This is kind of the expenses that they ran into. We're going to rephrase those later. I think. Let's go through. We're saying how much did you cost? Was it costing you? And I think it's good to say, okay, it cost you this and much. How much do you think the landlord is responsible for of that cost? So let's do it that way. How much is the landlord liable for? We're not going to use this sub question. I'm going to leave the placeholder there. Because we could say, um, write in your best estimate, why not? Okay, and now the se next section of this form is, what do you want the court to do about it? Hmm. To, um, I would, I would say the word remediate, which is not a good plain language term. To, uh, to help you solve your problem by asking the court to order, this is redundant, Let's say this, the court can order your landlord to do or to not do something to help solve problem. Check the boxes below for any action you want the court to order. We can wordsmith that later, but it doesn't hurt to do a little bit of pre-thinking about what, how you're phrasing these. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to just keep this as to do, clean up these So I think it's a good practice to just kind of, this is kind of like a place where you could put instructions, the person does the next step. If you see something that doesn't make sense. Remember, this is just a draft. We're gonna go in and edit it now. Okay. Um, interesting. So it's shown us the whole text here. That doesn't really matter. What we want is this file. Some of it didn't get indented. Oh, maybe there's a quote in there that broke something. Mm, no, I think it's fine. Oh, I see. Okay. I have to run this through another function to make sure it doesn't break anything, but it doesn't really matter for this stage here. So let's copy this into a new file um, inside our DocuSample Playground. We'll clean it up there, and I will help solve that issue with the line breaks there. So, oh, it isn't line break. It's fine. There is one here. We don't want that. All right. We want this all to be on one line. Let me think about that. We could use, it's called a here string in DocAssemble, or in Python that is. 
three quotes. It's not highlighting the way I expected it to, so I'm not sure if that's relevant. This is really good to go through this process so I can see what things people might run into that I didn't expect, you know? Here we had a really long description. It's the first time I did that. So I'm going to see if this works the way I'm doing it. I might have to turn it so everything's on one line in that. And we can kind of embed. We can embed the line breaks in there with special markers. <clears throat> And let me copy that file name that we wanted it to have. Oh, actually, it's in. It's already in this playground. Sorry, I forgot that. It's one of the metadata things we had here. We want it to be named Housing Temporary Restraining Order. Okay, now see all of these? These are the built-in fields that we were dealing with. So let's try, um, I thought I already was including those in this file. Is that in this folder? Let's see, where's currency? We're getting that error because something isn't working the way it's supposed to. It's not. Okay, so one thing I might do is just delete this description for now. See if that solves it, because that's the most obvious thing that looks a little funky. Okay, where else do I maybe have an error in this metadata block? That is the, the issue. So that's code. One thing I can do when I'm having problems with code inside DocAssemble, which is a pretty good integrated development environment, but it's not the best one. It's not as full featured as other ones are. I might have been disconnected from the stream, but I should be back on in just a second. Uh, let me just take a look here. I see someone sent a message on Slack. I just want to see if that's one. Okay. All right. Don't know if I'm on stream now. It looks like I am. Hopefully I am. All right. So we're going to look at the that in VS Code. So I'm going to just change. I'm going to have to add a new new video window capture here. I'm trying to get used to this whole streaming thing. Great. Okay. Now we definitely are back online. I'm going to call this VS Code, and we want to capture. There we go. Now you can see my Visual Studio Code window. Still figuring out this whole streaming thing. All right. So let's let's use this as kind of our cheat. What did I do? A new window instead of a new file. It's going to be our cheat code to figure out where the Python error is. Oh, and I can see right away what it is. Okay, this just isn't indented correctly. Okay, so I'm fairly sure that was the, the problem, but let's just check. 
I'm not seeing any errors now. So what this this editor does is it will kind of put like a little three red squiggles if there's a problem. See, and it's doing that for me now. And what's it say? Bad indentation. So it gives me a pretty useful way to solve the problem. And you can see it, it kind of cascaded down to lots of other problems. And oh wait, no, that wasn't indented wrong at all. And that wasn't the problem. Let me see. This is all supposed to be indented to the left. Okay, I think it's just sometimes the linter, that's the part that does the automatic error checking. Sometimes you need to save for it to work, so let's just save this to my downloads file folder here. And let's see if we get any more specific errors. Oh, <laughs> I'm using the wrong language to highlight it. That was a mistake. It's like, well, this doesn't look right. It's not highlighted correctly for being Python. Let me save it with .py in the name because it still seems to be highlighting it like it's a YAML file. Okay. Okay, so here's my problem on line 15. And that's not the most helpful, it just says invalid syntax. Oh, I see, I'm missing a, a comma right there. Okay, no more errors. So I have to go back in and make that same fix in my playground. And let me turn this off. There probably is a better way to do this than what I'm doing. Okay, so I have to add a comma after preferred court here. And I should be making a note of the things I have to do. So let me do that. I'm gonna actually add it to our backlog here. And after preferred court. All right. So no question type could be determined for the section. So I must have a typo there. I think it's not supposed to be includes, this thing is supposed to be include. And that explains why we have this error of all these undefined names, which we actually did define in that other file that we were starting the, the streaming session with. So I'm gonna look for includes and change it to include. Great, this is really promising. Okay, so we had some other variables that I never defined in that file that um, we can do really quickly right now. So we have defendants, docket numbers, and plaintiff. And let's start with those. So defendants is gonna be we could make it a, an object just as a default. It's gonna be really similar to this. Okay. 
So I'm just going to copy that and just change this here. Defendants, plaintiffs, just two Fs, not three. What else do we have? Signature date and docket numbers. Signature date. Docket numbers is the really the one we want here, actually. Does it what should docket number be? It's really just a list of things. So let's do But we want to be able to collect it. So okay, it's going to be a DA list still. It doesn't have objects in it. It's just a regular DA list. And what else? Plaintiff did signature date we need to do. So we're going to add a question here for the signature date. Let's put it above this whole stuff about Actually, it could go. It could go right with the signatures. That actually makes a lot of sense. All right. So let's write a doc assemble question. We haven't done that yet from scratch. So we're going to do all questions start with this question. What this is right here is this is a YAML file we're working in. That is a represents a dictionary key. If you're curious. Um, but what we call it in DocAssemble, in most of the documentation, they're called specifiers. We're, gonna use, we're using the question specifier. That's what starts. That's what controls the title. Like on this screen, it's, the, it's interview contents. That's the question part of this screen we're working on creating. So we're going to name this something like, what date should appear on the signed form? This will appear next to your signature on the finished PDF form. Now we're going to use a new specifier. OK, so I didn't introduce this one. So sub question is what controls the smaller text that appears on the screen. So again, going back to our wizard, it's all this text underneath that's not in big headline style. Fields we're going to create now. That's a that's where we start asking for the user to give us information. Underneath the fields specifier comes a list of items, which begin with a dash. We only have one question here, so we're going to just have here. It's going to say si signature date is the name of the field. Let me make sure that I have that. Yeah, we just had one, that's a singular variable. Okay, and before that, we're gonna be able to put the label that goes with it. So the label for this should be no label. There, we don't really want a label there. No label is kind of a shortcut to, because we already explained, it's only one thing we're asking for, and we already explained what we need to type up above. We do wanna make sure that we know it's a date, so data type, date. That's a pretty simple question we just wrote there. One thing, if you're getting new to DocAssemble <clears throat> and you wanted to find how do I ask about a date, these example blocks are super helpful. Target variable is the name of the field. This shows you how to write a great question about someone's birth date. We just did that from scratch, but you can always start with these example blocks. If you wanted to use them and you find the one you want, you can click insert and customize it. But I'm not going to do that. Okay, so we saved this. This is our kind of library of questions that all the forms are going to use eventually. Let's save this and see if some of those errors go away. Great. So we still have plaintiff, the singular plaintiff. Don't know if that's really supposed to be an object. We have defendants as plural. But why not? That might be a good way to solve it in case other people had a different version of the... Uh, it's probably something for us to clean up in the code. But we'll make that an individual object. All 
right? So we're saving it in our library of questions. And we're going to save this and see if that one more error goes away. Great, it did. Now, here is something special to this interview for the moment. We have username full2 and user signature verification. That's a unique one that we should have captured. I don't know why we didn't capture that one, actually. Um, I think that's a date, the date that they verified it. Let's look at the PDF again to see. Let me turn that back on for you to be able to see it. All right, so let's go down so we can find signature verification. Okay, so signature verification is, this is the verification block. This is something called a verified complaint. Basically, it's an extra requirement for certain types of, this is gonna be an ex parte hearing potentially without the other party there to be able to say their side of it. So you need to be extra, give yourself a little extra um, measure of seriousness by essentially we're just asking you to sign it twice. <laughs> like you're gonna say not just that I, um, normally by signing it, you're already saying everything in it is true. By, but by verifying it, you're saying it, that you're saying it's true under pains and penalties of perjury. So I don't know why that's really different. It's kind of the same thing. It is a requirement for some kinds of forms. So user signature verification is actually a copy of the user signature. So we're going to probably eventually want to have that be something that we take care of in our um, basic library of questions. We're not doing that yet, so let me put that in the backlog too. I'll keep it all in this one. Oh, you're not seeing this now, are you? Let me hide that window so you can see. This is really always going to be a copy of the user signature. So actually I'm writing that in there now, but there's no reason I can't just do the fix. I'm going to go back into the basic questions file. All right, so what are we doing? DocAssemble allows you to make copies of objects as references, right? This probably just makes sense to, to most of you if you've done any kind of programming or logic style things before. So we're going to assign a value to user signature verification. And that's going to be users zero, the first user signature. It's going to just be a straight copy of that. In DocAssemble, code doesn't run until it's needed. So if we if we use this user signature verification, it's going to be defined to the user signature. But if a form doesn't use it, it won't even look for this. So this will never trigger an error if we didn't. For example, maybe a form doesn't need to be signed. We wouldn't have collected this. It won't cause an error because we're not even trying to look for this variable. And actually, let's do the same thing with username full too, because that's something we do often enough. It's good to use separate code blocks for separate variables that you're trying to define, not try to cram everything into one code block. So what do we have? User name full with double underscores two. It's going to be equal to user.name.full. Internally, that's how the we're generating not just user, users zero. So we could actually translate that inside our assembly line wizard, but we also can do it here in this basic questions. It's the same impact. There's no reason for us to do it one way versus the other. This obviously is going to be easier for us to handle um, as people have already used the wizard because we can't go back in and rerun the wizard without doing a lot of extra work. So this is kind of a better fix for right now. Okay. So hopefully I'll remember those other fixes for the different sections.
Okay, perfect. This is what I wanted to see. It's running and there's no mandatory code blocks. That's on purpose because we didn't have any questions that um, we're kind of thinking right now our best understanding for how we're going to do this is by, um, oh, let's take care of this one too. We have that name, the same name appears three times on this form. So we want to make sure we have all of those taken care of. User's phone number appears twice. So we're going to take care of that in here. Basically, what I'm going to do is just scroll through. Let me ex I can explain what you're seeing here. There's a bunch of boilerplate that I'm like, well, we, we captured all this information when we ran the wizard. So let's store it so we can keep track of it if we, can, if we use it for anything later. We're not using it yet. OK, so this, this just isn't done, doesn't do anything in the interview right now. It's just something we can use later if we need it. So why not save all that information we got from the person running in the interview? This right here is the part where we take all of our variable names and turn them into information that goes on the form. So we're saying connect this field name in the PDF to this variable inside our interview. That's the order there. On the left in quotes is the PDF field name. On the right is the doc assemble field name. And we can do other extra logic in here if we need to for some things. So I'll point out one thing is, which is we already, we do turn the cost items into dollar figures by us, using this currency function. All right. This is the actual question that lets you answer that last download screen. So I'm gonna make this mandatory. In DocAssemble, a question doesn't run unless it's marked mandatory. But the way we do that is generally by controlling the order of questions in a code block. That's how I like to do it, just like this. So um, there is a code block that we're missing here, which I'm going to have to write later. I'll do that this morning. The code block that handles the order of the question for the different parts of a user's name. I think we're going to ask that at the end of the interview, once they filled out most of the form, because that's like kind of more comfortable for a lot of people. So we should be able to save and run this now. Now I will say something else I forgot to do, which is to um, upload the PDF. So let me do that too. We might handle some of these things automatically with the future iteration of the wizard. But for now, whoever is doing this step where you're customizing it, you have to actually upload the PDF. So what was this? How's he temporary standing order? Upload. Now it's available and it will be able to be filled in. So I think I don't need to refresh it, but I will. So this is kind of an awkward interface right now, right? But we're gonna. This is basically what we're talking about. So. This really connects directly to the PDF we had. And let me show that again. So if you look at this, right, so what were we doing? What are we asking for? At the beginning it says, this, these are checkboxes. Those appear as checkboxes on our screen. And we had an, a text field here for describe what happened with the utilities. So obviously we have to do some cleaning up, right? We don't want to show this unless they check the box. Same with this text area here. We only want to show that if they've checked the box. And um, in general, there's some ways we can make it look a little bit neater. Let me turn that screen off again. It's probably a better way to do this. I'll have to learn that the next time. It's like a capture my whole screen might be one way. Let's just check everything and see, just verify it appears on the PDF, which is what our goal is. So let's see. Did 
you see here, by making them currency, we got this dollar sign to show there. Let's go, um, hmm. The utility, I was really cold in the winter, let's say. Let's say that cost me $200, why not? This should be a dollar figure. I'm gonna actually just change that right now. So how much is the landlord liable for? I'm gonna change this right here to data type currency. And the next place this appears is in the PDF. So I'm gonna change that again. I'm, so here what I'm doing is I'm calling a function called currency. You can see here in the samples right above, I'm just gonna do the same exact thing. And I'm gonna transform that dollar figure on the PDF to have the dollar sign and to have um, a place for cents in the final output as well. The nice thing about this, I mean, DocAssemble, Jonathan Piles really thought a lot about how to make these features internationalized. So this will reflect the currency that you have set on your DocAssemble server. And you can override it if you're collecting dollars or collecting money that is in a different currency than the default one for your server too. Okay, so where am I going? Here we go. I was all took to change that to dollars. And by the way, by default it increments by pennies, but you can change that too. So I, an ideal experience right here would be to kind of collect the amount that they've already told us and reflect it back to them, right? So we're going to do that in the next version of this. All of these need to be cleaned up because we didn't give these fields really good labels yet. And we didn't get rid of this screen here, which isn't used anymore. We actually have a different way to give all those fields. Okay, so we had court0.name. There's no question for that yet, so let's figure that out. Why did we use name? Hmm. We have quartz zero. Do we have quartz zero? Oh, we just didn't have any question for quartz zero. I thought we did. We're going to look at our basic questions playground now. Let's look for quartz zero. Hmm. I don't know why that's not being triggered. One thing when you run into an error like this is just to kind of look at the trace back and see what triggered that. So, well, this was easy. So a, um, a court object, we're looking for an attribute of it called name. So I'm gonna, so that's triggered by this line right here. It needed court zero dot name because we were telling it spit out court zero here to map to the court name field on the PDF. But the name attribute should be filled in So I don't know why that's not showing there. Okay. Why it's not triggering that question to be asked since we have a question that defines it. Oh, let's do a little thing here. We can tell DocAssemble to, look, to force it to look for this question. It should do this on its own. really shouldn't be necessary, but we're going to try it. Those aren't used for anything, so we don't really need that.
Okay, I didn't change anything. It's not going to do anything different, <laughs> but there's still a tendency to want to do that. Okay, so why did it say it couldn't do that? Let's see if we get any more information here. Maybe it's because we don't, this is a DA list. So this is something, I'm not sure if this was right. So we have it set to there are any is true. Hmm. We can force it to ask that question. There's one way we can do it, which is to give that question its own label. So if you want to run a docassemble question and you don't care about actually gathering information on that screen, you would do this. Add a continue button field. So if we let's see if we can get this to run. And if we do, if it will still give us that error, if it can actually co collect the person's name. And get rid of this question we don't really need. That'd be fresh. <clears throat> so it's asking the question. Plaintiff.name.first. Okay, so that's a question we didn't ask. So I'm going to do something here. We're going to make another generic object question that will help us fill in a person's name. There's no reason for us to write that from scratch. is the name of So there are some special features of DocAssemble. This is a, kind of a cool one. This is a, if you're using the individual object, it can reflect back its own name to help you write these generic questions. So actually I started by writing just regular possessive. That wouldn't have worked. I need to use this object possessive form because this object doesn't have a name yet. It would give kind of a circular logic loop. This is going to write back the plaintiff, I believe, if I did, got the syntax right. Was plaintiff not an individual? Oh, of course. Here's the problem. This doesn't actually work for any person until I make it generic. which is by putting it with an X, not the way I wrote it actually. So X is a placeholder for a generic object, which you can see I used that here. So anytime that our object is of the class individual, X will be replaced with the actual object's name. So in this case, it will be users, or it will be um, plaintiff is gonna be what's filled in there. Still saying I don't have it. <laughs> Maybe I didn't create the object that I needed. Oh, I know why. Uh, sorry, it's a whole different problem than I was thinking. I have to save, click save on this to be able to do what I'm doing with it, which is just refreshing the screen. That's just kind of a, a playground issue. It's not a um, an issue that would affect it live. Okay. 
See, so it translated this part here, the plaintiff, apostrophe S, is, came from the fact that our object is named plaintiff. So it's able to reflect back. It's kind of like a really a cool feature, and that's part of why choosing the right variable names is, is a helpful idea. So let's name our plaintiff Jane Smith. Docket number zero. Oh, we didn't actually end up writing a question for that, so we need to do that. Where did we ask about docket number? We have the singular version of it. We didn't have the one that lets you have multiple questions. So I'm actually thinking we might just change that so it's always singular, but we can do it this way. So what I'm going to do is use a cool feature of DocAssemble, which is called list collect, which lets you collect multiple things on one screen. I'll give this a try. I think it will work even if our thing we're collecting is not an object. So we want it to be docket numbers. Gotta save both of these files for me to be able to refresh it here. Cool, that worked. Okay, so we have defendants. That was one that we didn't have anything. So I think what we would do, let's let's think about this. So we might want to use the same list collect feature here. Um, we would have a question like this. Who are the defendants on this form? That's not the best plain language, but we can use that. Again, we're going to use the list collect feature here. And we need a question that asks for the person's name. Okay, so defendants is a list of people, individuals. So we'll use that same style. So we have defendants. I is a placeholder that stands in for an item on a list. I dot name dot first. We don't really care about their whole name, and sometimes they won't have a whole name. They might be. They might might not have two parts of their name. That is, they might be like a, a landlord. Very often, it's going to be a, a corporation, so they don't have two parts of their name. Okay, so it's still saying, oh, I didn't save this file yet, that's why. That was not it. Something else is wrong here, let's see. Okay, so it's saying it didn't know if there was any item in that list. But didn't, wasn't the same thing true for plaintiff? No, it was not. There always has to be a defendant in this one. So I think what we're going to do here is in our interview specific file, we're going to say is always true. There's always at least one defendant. for a landlord. Okay, so now we're asking for your name at the end, which is good. The reason why it's doing it at the end is because we didn't enforce the order of that question. So eventually we're going to want to think through a, a good order for all these questions about things like your name. Now here, the plaintiff is the same as the person who's filling out the form. So we really want to figure out that logic so that it, it asks us for who's the plaintiff. This is the address auto completion feature that I was talking about. 
let's try entering. So this is the address of Suffolk Law School. My phone. I don't remember if this has email validation. Okay, so we, we want that. We do want that. We want to make sure that we're using the email validation stuff. So let's do that. I'm going to change this to data type email. Again, I have to save both places. So now it's actually validating that to make sure it's a valid email address. The phone number does not have any validation like that. My goal is to get us to getting to the end screen. So this again, other party, we really want to ask about the other party first and then say, is this other party the plaintiff or the defendant? Something like that. But we also could just say that plaintiff is equal to other party. We want to have a better question for this is my point. We don't have it yet, but we will. So this is going to be redundant. Okay, I'm trying to let you see the address auto completion and not show you the um, auto completion that Firefox does, but it's okay. Let's not use a real address. So I actually happen to have a touch sensitive screen, so I'm going to be able to sign right there. Okay, I guess one of these must still be needed. I don't remember which one. Let's see why. So remember I deleted that from our list of, of variables that we're, we're controlling the order of the variables. And I don't know why that's being triggered. So I needed address of court county, but we I thought we already... Oh, I see why, okay. Okay, well, what am I doing? I don't need that on there twice. <laughs> I only need it once. Okay, so I'm saying court dot address but actually it's courts zero. I don't think we need that to be plural, so we might change that. Hey, it created a form for us, so. A lot of work along the way. Let me show you the screen, which you're not seeing yet. Well, you'll be able to see all of our fields are filled in. I can find the control for that. Sorry. Not that one. Make a new one. Okay, this is the right one. Okay, I was trying to say, like, oh, it's not right. But it is. So you can see we actually filled in all the fields that we were trying to fill in. It look like, looks like they all went to the right place. These checkboxes were not checked, so I'm going to have to look into that. These were checked. Oh, maybe I just didn't have... Uh, I don't know why those are checked and the other ones weren't. That's very interesting. We'll have to look that up and figure out if that's a quality control thing we need to do. Now the signature appeared here, but not here. So I don't know why that didn't happen. And this is a text field. That should be the name. So that's a cleanup thing we have to do on the form, actually. 
But otherwise, this is pretty good, right? This is what we did. So now I did so much on that form that you would not need to do when you're doing your own. Because if you know, remember, I was constantly going in and editing things in this basic questions. That's really a process thing that we're figuring out to figure out which questions we need in here in our question library. You don't need to do that. We're going to write those once so that you can use them automatically. The work that I did in here is what you should pay attention to. And basically what we're doing is we're looking around, we're cleaning up the labels of the form of the fields. We are um, we are doing things like, well, this data block at the top, I had to do some cleanup, which I'll do in the... If you've already run through the wizard, you'll have to do some manual cleanup. But if you haven't, then um, it should be fixed for you. You won't have to do that at all. We're going to mostly be doing things like this, like just going in and cleaning up this name. So here, what was the first? Right, like, so how much did it cost you? So this is a pretty fine way to do this, by the way. We just have a bunch of checkboxes, and there's only three spots on the form. If I were writing this from scratch, and it wasn't in a PDF where we had to fit it into a certain space, I would have done this differently. <clears throat> <coughs> I wouldn't have used three questions. I would have written one question and, and done it in a list, just like we did with that list collect feature that you saw a second ago. So this is the kind of thing you're gonna do. Just like going and you're gonna have someone tell you, we wanna change this wording. And then you as an editor might go in and um, just try to find the right part of, of this file and change it in the right place to, to change the language. That's almost all what, that you're gonna do. And then you're going to have to probably be able to find other kind of bugs and report them to someone like me or Matt or anybody else who has the doc assemble experience to help you figure out why you're running into that issue. So um, I'm going to go in and if you already have one of these wizard generated files, you might have to go in and clean up some of the same things that we did that I did here. But you can ask for help with that if you just want to start playing around with the language changes. This here at the end of the interview file, this is what controls the order of the question. So if you think you wanted to change that order, you could just move one of these lines up. Like let's say I wanted to ask a, that question about when it's gonna be court first, I could do that. I still don't know why that's not triggering this question automatically, so I have to look into that. That's probably something we can fix in the basic questions file. Um, one more thing is, I should change this so it looks for the installed version of this package, which it doesn't right now, because I have it in my playground, right? So that lets me um, <clears throat> change it and see the change right away. But you won't be able to access something in my playground if you're at doing your own editing, but you couldn't access it if it was installed on the whole server. So let's... I'll show you one more thing, which is how to install a package on DocAssemble, which you won't necessarily do right away, but eventually you might want to do. We're putting all these files in this package on GitHub called docassemble-ma virtual court. I'm going to add this and add this template to that package. We're going to have just one big package with all the interviews in it eventually. Okay. So added initial version of the housing TRO. It's good to put it. What I'm doing here is I'm sending this code that I just worked on up to GitHub. That's a really important step to do as you're working. So you can keep track of the versions, make sure that um, when you find a bug later, you can trace back to the last working version. It also makes it possible to share it with other people. Let me show you what that did. that 
code up to here. So you can see here it says 16 seconds ago. It shows the commit message that I gave, which was added initial version of the housing TRO. And I can go through and see exactly what changed. This is the file that got changed there. Oh, this is the metadata. There's the whole text of that file, because it's one big file I added. But it also shows me the things I changed in the basic questions. So if I wanted to say, like, hey, you introduced a bug in basic questions, I could go down and find exactly where that happened. What was the changes that happened? This is like um, a compare in something like Microsoft Word. Okay, now, since I'm the person who's maintaining this package, I'm going to go ahead and install it. That makes it available for everybody on the server. Now that I've done that, we have a relatively good draft of the um, basic questions file. We are going to change that include so it refers to the version that's installed, so that when you're working with it, you don't have to have a copy of that file in your own playground. And then if you notice a problem in that basic questions, just um, send it to me or to another person who can fix it, has access to that package. All right, um, this was much, much more successful, except I just see that you didn't see anything that I was just showing. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I'll redo that just really quickly. What did I do? I went to the packages menu here. This is what a package looks like in DocAssemble, something you access from the Playground menu. I selected the new files by holding Control that I added. So that was this one here, housing temporary restraining order.yaml and housing temporary restraining order.pdf. Those are my new files. Click the GitHub button to, to actually push it up to GitHub. Install button to make it available on the server. And then I just was showing you also what that commit looks like on GitHub. So. Here's the link to the package. I can see the history of it by clicking the commit button. See? And I was just showing on the red are lines that were deleted, on the right are lines that were added. So I changed user zero to users, plural, zero. The version number changed by one. That's really helpful when you're trying to track down bugs. Okay. I'm going to sign off. Thank you for anybody who watched, and I'm going to post this on YouTube as soon as I can. Hope that's helped.